welcome to our eighth episode of Talking With Titan. Absolutely delighted to have Kate McDade and Daniel Davey, who have previously co-hosted these sessions with me, now in the hot seat. And in addition to that, to welcome our fabulous new ambassador, Scott Bapti. Scott, we're going to start with yourself. My name is Scott Bapti. My background is it's not the most conventional way into nutrition. I started off working in IT. On the side of that, I had a blog where I would post about recipes and fitness and what I was doing in the gym and all that kind of thing. I ended up going back to uni to do master's in sports nutrition, worked with quite a few professional football clubs, runners, cyclists, triathletes, bodybuilding, fitness modeling. But now it's, let's say, 99% of the people I'm working with, helping them to lose weight, but in a sustainable form, see some clarity and realize they can eat pretty much anything they like, all within moderation. I run a nutrition consultancy called NutriCate. I have the pleasure of working with elite level athletes, teams, people looking to improve their health. We also deliver seminar workshops to the corporate sector. I also do a bit of lecturing at the moment too in applied nutrition. No two days are the same. I suppose I love that element of my job. I have always been interested in food. I guess the other thing in my life has always been sport and my entire focus was about performing better myself in sport or helping others to perform well. I've carried that through to working with elite teams and individual athletes. When it comes to all three of you, you all have a very tailored approach to nutrition from a social media perspective. You're probably sick of being asked the question around social media and how it's evolved the landscape, but I think it would be remiss given you've got three very different approaches not to touch on what your approach is and why you've decided to take that approach and, and was it strategic and thought out or is this just the natural way you communicate with people? Back in probably 2010, when I started working with the Dublin hurling team, that was probably my first entry into elite sport. I realized or recognized very early on while my interest was in understanding the science of nutrition that even elite athletes like short sharp pieces of information and like everybody else they're engaged through media. I set up a, a Facebook group. I started to share some images of my own meals online. So it all started from there and nothing has changed except our attention spans are less than ever. There's an awful lot of imagery out there that's an awful lot better looking than what I put out. So it's about how do you engage people around very kind of precise content in terms of preparing meals and preparing recipes and get them to be part of the process. I try and bring my credibility to the fore in terms of this is what I eat, but also what the athletes that I work with eat. And this can help you achieve your goal. Have you ever felt that you've had to compromise your approach to keep up with how social media has changed? Or is that something that you'll never compromise on? I had a very, very hard line approach when I started. As I've evolved as a practitioner, I've realized that if you want to bring people along, then you need to broaden the types of, of meals that you provide. There needs to be a lot of variety in there. I would never compromise on my really specific messages or I'd never compromise on who I'd work with. I would say I would have softened my approach in, let's say, the, the ingredients. The, the kind of running joke with me is how much cheese I use. Do you love yep. the fromage? <laughs> I do. I do like the cheese. When I started, I would have been concerned about, oh my God, these bars have a thousand calories in them and I would have been concerned about putting that out there initially but now it's well hold on a second these can work under this kind of context once you're pretty much devoted to your job and you hold that integrity it's just about sticking at it and it's about clarifying what your key message is and repeating that message with that integrity as the as the backbone to to what you do every day I think I'll go to Kate next to answer that original question because you're at a slightly different stage to the two lads and that you probably came onto the social media scene how many years ago in terms of nutrition three years now longer three years yeah one of the you know niceties of running your business is that I can stay true to my beliefs and my systems and the direction I want to operate in because I see a lot of value in it you know I want to enjoy what I do and I think it's very evident if you enjoy what you're doing mm -hmm. through what you put out for me authenticity you know through and through is so important and it's a learning process you know what you think will work and it's the same with athletes and clients try it this way 
if it doesn't work as well as you thought, well, you're learning from that and you're taking you know, mm. both positives and negatives from and then you're trying to build upon it. So Scott, over to yourself. I found people seem to prefer the more personal content. The examples of this is, you know, you spend an hour creating a really good infographic about protein timing and you think, oh, this is an absolute doozy. This has got so good info. It's really clear. And then nobody likes it and it hardly <laughs> gets any reach. So nobody sees it. And then you put a photo up of with the dog or out on a walk with a baby and everyone's like oh, is this one. is amazing best photo ever people seem to like social media to make them feel good and if you develop that bond and people like oh i like that guy they've got good content then when you do post something they're more likely to sit up and listen it depends on the platform as well and mm-hmm. the type of content so i found like facebook seems to be a better place for putting the recipes and the educational content whereas instagram seems to be more of that personal interaction just tailor the content mm-hmm. or the platform you're on and also under understanding who your audience is behind each platform that'll massively impact what what you're putting out there the other side of showing your personal life or whatever extent you want to show of that that brings with its own challenges where's the cutoff point if you feel like that's what's going to really draw people in I, i suppose i made a decision quite some time ago to do what i am comfortable with and that happens to be predominantly sharing recipes and meal ideas. Scott is absolutely right. When I put up a photo of me on the farm or something else that's not food, it always performs better than than any recipe. But that's not why I'm on social media. I don't want to be too black and white about it. I do really enjoy sharing content because it's almost like an expression of my enjoyment in the kitchen. On the other side, like I'm trying to run a business off the back of it and I'm trying to keep the two of them quite separate. I share content from my office and I share content from from the kitchen and that's how I allow myself to separate the two of them. And that seems fair. I feel like how would you ever know what is your downtime and what's not if everything is shared and everything is a, there's a commercial value to it. Kate, what about yourself? I don't mind sharing the personal side. I'm not looking to sell myself entirely in terms of everything about me but I do think it's important and it's also nice to share little bits of the person behind Nutricate or the team or you know the content that's being put out I try and go with kind of how I'm feeling and not try and confuse what is this platform actually about yeah. and for me it's putting out good content so Scott finally over to yourself in terms of what your boundary is if I didn't use it for work I would probably be one of these people that didn't have a Facebook page and I try and limit my use of it as much as possible and that I'll for Facebook for example I schedule the week's posts uh, on a Monday for the whole week and I don't have any social apps on my phone except Instagram but it gets deleted on a Friday comes back on again on a Monday so that's just one of the ways I create a boundary for myself. So we're coming into the winter months darker days maybe not the same enthusiasm for getting out there and getting their exercise in and then obviously all the conversations around immunity with Covid from a nutrition perspective what kind of advice do we need to be giving people and if we take a general population view as opposed to going into the athlete just yet. With regards to exercise if you find it as a bit of a chore and you are purely doing it because you feel you should not because you want to maybe think about doing it first thing as soon as you wake up in the morning using this brian tracy method which i was talking about it's called eating the frog and if you had to eat a frog it's probably best to eat it first thing in the morning so it's done rather than taking little bites of the frog as you go throughout the day because that would be worse so from a psychological perspective if you exercise first thing it's out of the way and you can enjoy the rest of your day on the nutrition side of things one thing people can pay attention to is variety of what they're eating try and buy at least one different type of fruit and one different type of vegetable compared to what you bought last week or if you go into a supermarket and you've you see something and you always think i don't know what to do with it go and buy it and learn a recipe this is against beneficial psychologically because you're not eating the same thing day in day out and also you're benefiting from a broader spectrum of nutrients if you are not just eating the same three vegetables three types of fruit and even on the note of fruit and vegetables and trying to switch it up if you're concerned about food wasted frozen alternatives do the job too staying hydrated can help support your immune system having a water bottle on your desk so you can sip on it throughout the day Vitamin D might be something to consider too in the winter months in particular from a, an overall health perspective and a mood perspective and certainly from the immunity standpoint. Really pairing things back and figuring out, you know, what are your little easy wins, I think will always stand testament to your overall health. Daniel, over to yourself. About five years ago, I, I started handing out boost packs to the team athletes that I work with. Very simple stuff like uh, Kate has mentioned, vitamin C and maybe some zinc and vitamin D. 
D. Mm. And when people become immune compromised or feel run down, the first thing they think about is this boost pack. They don't think about why they may have become immune compromised in the first place. And that's back to the basics. The boost pack allows me to have that conversation with an athlete to say, what has your sleep been like? What has your exercise load been like? Have you got variety in your diet? It's all encompassing everything that everyone is saying, but Mm. it's almost like you need to review and also look at your week ahead so that you are able to execute these things. We'll delve a little bit deeper into that in terms of elite sport and the idea of under eating, how you guys have come across that potentially with various different athletes and if gender plays a role there. It was probably when working with recreational athletes, top club athletes or so on, it's almost the simplest thing to do to give them an instant improvement is just eat more carbs. And it sounds really basic, but when you look at food diaries and so on of people who are going out for three, four, five hour cycles at the weekend and you say, you know, what's your your sports nutrition protocol like? Are you you taking anything? Oh yeah, yeah, take gels. Yeah, how many to take? One on a five hour cycle. Right, let's up that a little bit you know, Mm. maybe double eventually up to five or whatever. And it's just that carbohydrate availability is is very easy for them to do. You know, next weekend they say, oh, you know, actually I ate a decent meal a couple hours beforehand. I ate several snacks and then replenished after. And I had my fastest 50K whatever they've ever done. And it just seems a really basic one. I think it's just people are just underestimating energy demands Mm. in that session. If you want to grind the numbers, we're looking at like 30 to 60 grams of carbs per hour for exercise over an hour so for people going out for a two-hour cycle three-hour cycle you need more than a sports drink so daniel i'll pose the same question to you in terms of that under fueling piece and i might add another dimension to that and ask if you've noticed a difference between say male athletes versus female athletes maybe i didn't have enough awareness to see how much of an issue it was when i started out as a practitioner i'm seeing it now more in in male athletes than ever before. Whereas previously, amenorrhea and insufficient intake of just energy and calories would be associated with female athletes a lot more frequently. Definitely seeing a greater concern about body composition, particularly within male athletes who are concerned about how they look as much as how they're performing. When you help that athlete understand that when you get both right, you will look at your best and perform at your best. That's when we're going to see you in in the healthiest possible state. There is an element there where you kind of get into territory where there's the psychological hang up almost in and around energy intake and what impact that might have from a body composition perspective, as Daniel mentioned there, depending on who the athlete is and depending on where they're at, like you do have to tackle it with caution um, in the sense that, you know, if someone is particularly vulnerable, it's really important as practitioners that we can create an environment where they're comfortable relaying the struggle that they're feeling or how they're genuinely feeling running around a pitch or on a court or whatever it might be you know having a an environment where an athlete first and foremost is comfortable telling you exactly where they're at so you can even broach a subject like this I think is is really important and also making them aware of how much of an impact it's having so from bone health if they're getting injured a lot or having tummy issues all of a sudden mood is poor they're a lot more irritable like the list goes on from females they might lose their menstrual cycle making them aware that this is all interlinked do you ever find now that you're getting questions and be it in the maybe in the more mental health side of things that people are coming to you and 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 asking for help and you potentially don't feel like you're maybe the right person to be giving that type of guidance and how do you manage that every time i do a live q a i start off by saying if you've got an injury i can't tell you exercises to work around it because i'm not physio if you have a medical issue that affects how you i can't give you recommendations because i'm not a dietitian if i don't know the answer i can't give you the answer because i don't know it won't just try and you know yeah. spraff a load of nonsense but i think the benefit of having a network like this is that i am able to refer people we don't have to try and pretend we know what we're talking about when we don't and the person who's asking will get a better response from the right person anyway daniel will you be of the same view absolutely the more people within your network that you can refer on to uh, the more that you can help people that's mm-hmm. what it's all about in terms of people now not being able to go to gyms and the ultimately the lockdown in both ireland and the uk say come January and hopefully the gyms are back up and running and they haven't been in that environment for a while probably more prone to potentially picking up an injury etc what role does nutrition play for you from a prevention perspective protein is one I often find with clients um, and even athletes who again you would think maybe would have a good foundation or a good understanding can 
be slightly off the mark with this. So mm. from a recovery perspective, making sure that there's adequate amount of protein on a, a day-to-day basis is mm-hmm. so, so important. Day-to-day habits all add up. And I think if you can look to improve on maybe identifying one or two that you might be a little bit off the mark with, that will stand to you no matter what you're mm. kind of throwing your hand at come January. I would say the reason why I've got such an interest in nutrition for injury recovery is because this is something that athletes can control because we've had such a focus on it for the past three years, I've seen the difference that that attention to detail can make in shortening the time frame and the return to play for athletes. It's not about taking two and three weeks off and completely disengaging and sitting on the couch and eating chocolate. This is what we can control. And back to Kate's point on understanding your load. The biggest factor that will influence your risk for injury is the load on your body. So if you're not matching your energy intake and your nutrient profile with the load that you're currently putting on your body or you're going to put on your body, then your risk for injury dramatically goes up. Brilliant. Okay, guys, well, thank you so much for coming on. Really, really appreciate it. And that is the close of Talking With Titans. Thanks, guys. Thanks, (laughs) Amelia. Bye. (laughs)